Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Uh, intro, inserted. I don't know what I'm doing. Let's go. Listen, original link to the video, top of the description, right below that link to the Discord. Click on it, send it right over there. We'd love to have you. Battle of Zenta, 1697, Battle that Napoleon studied. Battle that Napoleon studied. Oh, yeah, he liked new Eugene, uh, Eugene's Masterpiece, Part 3. Go. History March, awesome channel. If you are not ready to learn, that is what we're doing here, okay? We're learning. There's the door. Well, Mac is down the hall. You're in the wrong class. Friend. Or sit in the back, that's fine. Following their decisive victory at the Second Battle of Mohács, Imperial forces reconquered much of the central parts of the former Kingdom of Hungary. Emperor Leopold secured further diplomatic victories in the following period, as the Hungarian Diet agreed to make the House of Habsburgs the hereditary kings of Hungary. In the spring of 1688, the Transylvanian nobility proclaimed an end to their Ottoman vassal status, to become the subjects of the King of Hungary again. Young Eugene of Savoy fought both capably and valiantly in the previous years, and he continued to do so in 1688 when he participated in the siege of Belgrade. The imperial forces under the command of Elector Max Emanuel of Bavaria captured the fortress on September the 6th. Eugene took a bullet to the knee during the siege, which forced Ow. him out of service until the beginning of 1689. By the early months of 1689, Habsburg succeeded in reconquering most of the territories belonging to the former Kingdom of Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire was on the ropes. Most Christian Turk, most Christian Ravager of Christendom, House of Commons Journal of Louis XIV, April 15th, 1689. It was King of France, Louis XIV, who came to the rescue of the Ottomans. Louis intended to create a more easily defensible frontier for France, seizing the required lands by force. Eager to intimidate the German princes, Louis ordered his forces to cross the Rhine in the autumn of 1688. However, he badly misjudged the political mood inside the Holy Roman Empire what are you and doing? Europe itself. Instead of backing down in the face of French arms, the princes of empire rallied around the emperor and were ready to fight against Louis. William of Orange and Charles II of Spain also joined the alliance. Instead of a short war of intimidation, the conflict turned into a nine-year-long war of attrition. Starting in 1689, the bulk of the imperial forces were redeployed against the French, which gave the Ottoman Empire the breather it needed. Max Emmanuel was transferred from Hungary to take command of the imperial forces in the Rhineland. Eugene of Savoy served as his capable lieutenant general throughout the campaign of 1689. For the campaign of 1690, he was transferred to the Italian frontier, where he joined his cousin Victor Amadeus of Savoy. Newly promoted to General of the Cavalry, up, up. his rise in the ranks continued. He was frustrated by Victor's military decisions, but skillfully saved his cousin's army after the defeat at the Battle of Stafarta, allowing the Allied forces to retreat in good order, rather than in a disorganized route. The Allies usually outnumbered the French in northern Italy. Still, as they were made up of a mixture of Imperial, Savoyard and Spanish forces, cooperation was often difficult. Eugene did not hide his frustration when he wrote back to Vienna, commenting that had everyone done their duty, they would have beaten the French long ago. Despite his criticisms, Eugene equipped himself well in his subordinate commander roles and was promoted to the rank of Field Marshal in 1693. Italy, however, proved to be a sideshow in the war, and the conflict there ended earlier than in other parts of Europe. Disheartened by the reverses and fearing the increase of imperial influence in his country, Victor Amadeus left the alliance early in 1696. He 
sabotaged the war effort in the final years, Dude. and Eugene could never trust him thereafter. Stalemate in the Great Turkish War, 1690-96. It's, it's interesting how Napoleon, um, you know, was studied and respected and was fascinated with someone who was, a, was going against France. Anyways. The war against the Ottoman... Well, I guess it was the French before the French Revolution. Uh, never mind. An empire. The war against the Ottoman Empire continued. Besides the war against the Habsburgs, the Ottomans were fighting against Venice, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and Russia. The 1690 counteroffensive saw the Ottomans lay siege to Belgrade. After just six days, its garrison surrendered. A local uprising by the energetic Emmerich Tokoy prevented any Habsburg army from relieving the city. At the cost of losing Belgrade, the Habsburgs managed to save Transylvania. Still, with the bulk of the German armies deployed against the French, the Habsburgs simply lacked the numbers to continue their initial successes, and a stalemate developed. Some minor battles occurred, such as the Battle of Slankamen in 1691. Thanks to their highly mobile light cavalry, the Ottomans still posed a considerable danger in skirmishes and raids. Uh -huh, bah, bah, bah. Some minor battles occurred, such as the Battle of Slankamen in 1691. Thanks to their highly mobile light cavalry, the Ottomans still posed a considerable danger in skirmishes and raids. In 1695, the Elector of Saxony, Augustus the Strong, became the commander of the Habsburg forces. The young and inexperienced commander turned out to be an uninspired choice. Following the Habsburg defeat at Belgrade, the Ottomans, led by the new Sultan Mustafa II, scored a string of victories at the battles of Lugos, Ulas, and Senei. Many contemporaries blamed Augustus for the reverses, though luckily for the Habsburgs, these victories, though no doubt lifted the Ottoman morale, gained them no lasting strategic advantage. As the warring parties entered the year 1697, most people probably expected the stalemate to continue. One ambitious imperial commander had other plans. With the war on the Italian front ending in 1696, Field Marshal Eugene of Savoy was transferred. I had to fix something. Commander had other to continue. One ambitious imperial commander had other plans. With the war on the Italian front ending in 1696, Field Marshal Eugene of Savoy was transferred to the Danubian frontier for next year's campaign. Augustus resigned his command in 1696 to pursue the throne of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Eugene replaced him. Eugene finally received what can be called his first independent command. Campaign of 1697, road to Zenta. The victories of the previous two years emboldened the Sultan. In 1697, he took to the offensive. He departed from Edirne in April. It is estimated that his army numbered between 60,000 and 100,000 soldiers. The huge Ottoman force reached Belgrade on August the 11th. Eugene's army facing them numbered around 70,000 in total. His situation was anything but rose-colored. By July, the supplies were scarce. At most, there were provisions and arms to cover around half of his army. Additionally, contingents of imperial soldiers had to be diverted to quell minor revolts. It would not be an exaggeration to state that simply to... holding together the army that. was a feat in itself. Able commanders such as Guido Stahenberg certainly aided Eugene. The Viennese court sent Eugene strict orders to remain on the defensive. However, this was not something the ambitious commander intended to adhere to. When Eugene received intelligence about the movements of the Ottoman forces, he decided to concentrate most of his available manpower around Petrovaradin, a town My north of My freaking eyes! Jesus! 
technical grade. For intelligence about the movements of the Ottoman forces, he decided to concentrate most of his available manpower around Petrovaradin, a town north of Belgrade. By the time the concentration of troops was realized, he had around 50,000 soldiers under his command. Emmerich Tokoy advised the Sultan to march east rather than north. The Sultan agreed, and they headed toward the now Habsburg-held Transylvania. The Ottomans reached the river Tisa on September 10th and began to ford the river. This channel is so freaking good. How it started, amazing maps, and it starts, and it kind of goes in and in, and then the namesake of the video ends up in a close-up battle. It's just such a good formula. The Ottomans reached the river Tisa on September 10th and began to ford the river the next day. The engineers did a superb job. However, even taking into consideration the skill of the engineers, for such a force to pass from one side of the river to the other took considerable time. And during this time, the army was virtually split into two, and such fordings always held an element of danger. Thanks to the accurate information relayed to him by his scouts, Prince Eugene was fully aware of the activity and the whereabouts of the Ottoman army, and he now saw the perfect opportunity to strike a deadly blow against the temporarily divided Ottoman army. Unlike the Imperials, the Ottomans were largely in the dark about the movements of their enemies, and had they known just how close Prince Eugene's army was to them, they probably would not have attempted to ford the river. Despite the arrival of strict orders not to attempt any risky offensive, Prince Eugene decided to attack the Turks while they were still fording the river. He force-marched his army on the 11th of September and arrived at the scene of the Ottomans crossing the river by the late afternoon, just as the sun began to set. Once he arrived, Prince Eugene personally inspected the strategic situation. He saw that the Ottomans built strong defenses on both sides of the bridge. According to his estimates, the interior ditch was about 500 paces long on either side. Behind it, there were wagons and around 100 guns in defensive positions. Ahead of the interior ditch, there was a slightly longer, around 1,000 paces long, circumvallation which was meant to reach the river, but the arrival of Eugene's army did not leave enough time to finish these works. As the Turks were not defending the ditches in great numbers, Eugene now saw the perfect opportunity to order an all-out assault. Despite the 10 hours of forced march, Prince Eugene attacked almost immediately. He lined up cavalry on the two flanks, infantry in the middle, and ordered an all-out assault against the Ottoman troops. By this time, the Sultan, most of his cavalry and part of the infantry, were on the other side of Leaping. the Tisa, but most of the infantry, with the Grand Vizier and the artillery, was yet to cross. The Imperial cavalry on the left was the first one to engage the enemy when they repelled an attempt from the Ottomans to break out. Once the Ottoman attack was repelled, Guido Stahenberg, who was in command of the left flank, in turn led a counterattack, but his troops were repelled by the Ottoman guns. In response, the Imperial troops opened artillery fire as well. While Starnhomburg's attack was momentarily checked, the Imperial center and right descended into the Ottoman trenches and steadily pushed them back in a brutal melee. Hey, uh, quick, See, quick, quick, quick question. I know I'm pausing in the middle of a battle, but... Where... I know, like, a lot of invading armies had, like, their own historians, but... Where do we get all of this? Like, wh where do we... Who is it? Like, are, are they aware? Like, all right. All battles in history have kind of been, or a lot of battles, big ones, have been written down. And, and and so do they have someone there, like on both sides, that is like, your job is to to record the troop movements, and that's how we're able to know the troop movements? Or is it less? Okay. ...and steadily push them back in a brutal melee. Seeing the distress of his troops, the Grand Vizier led a cavalry attack against the Imperial left. 
his attack was repelled, and Stahenberg's counterattack nearly penetrated as far as the Ottoman bridge. Prince Eugene sent reinforcements from the center to Stahenberg. The Imperials were pushing towards the bridge, trying to cut off the only retreat the Ottomans had. Seeing their route of escape threatened, many from the Ottoman camp tried to flee while they still could. Artillery bombardments against the bridge caused it to collapse. What followed was an utter massacre as the surrounded and overwhelmed Ottomans tried to swim across the river, only to drown in it. With the cohesion of the defenders broken, I was amazed at like how many people drown, and I asked this. I remember one of the comments in the, in my reaction saying, I, "I forget what video it was, but like me being surprised at how many people drowned." And I'm thinking, you know, you know, all the all the chaos of running away, like running for your life, and and having a lot of armor on. But then a lot of people say like some didn't know how to swim, and I guess, I mean, I don't know how much. Okay, so. A lot. So you're telling me that a lot of people who died in the river didn't know how to swim. So it's either, you know, risk swimming or die by bullets. The Imperials massacred the Ottomans. By the time the battle was over, Prince Eugene won a decisive victory. In total, Eugene lost around 700 dead and another 1,900 wounded, while the Ottoman losses numbered between 20,000 and 30,000 killed, wounded, and missing. Besides losing from a third to a fifth of his army, the Sultan lost more than 100 guns. That's got to be one of the most, most one-sided death tolls I've ever seen. It's like one in ten. So like ten Ottomans died for every one Imperial. At the highest count of 160, his treasury, supplies, food and ammunition, several thousand wagons, and some humiliating personal losses like the seal of the Sultan and his sword. Seeing the disaster unfolding, the Sultan was only a helpless spectator. And after his forces on the other side of the river were overwhelmed. Would a sword be especially, because don't like a lot of surrendering involve like presenting a sword. So would that be like extra embarrassing? Like, they, damn it, they, they caught my sword or they... He fled to Tameshvar and then to Istanbul. The victory at center was enough to tilt the balance of power decisively in favor of the Habsburgs. Though the fighting continued for another 14 months, during which time Eugene raided the Balkans and sacked Ottoman-held Sarajevo, the outcome of the long Turkish war was decided at Zenta. The warring sides signed the Treaty of Karlovitz on January 26, 1699. According to the treaty, the Ottomans formally ceded the Egri Eyali, Varat Eyali, Budin Eyali, and parts of the Temeshvar and Bosnia Eyali to the Austrian Habsburgs, most of Podalia to Poland-Lithuania, parts of the Dalmatian coast and Morea to Venice. Negotiations with Russia continued for another year, but in 1700 the Ottomans ceded Azov to the Russians. The Ottomans also lost an important vassal, the Principality of Transylvania, which was to be governed from that point on by governors named by Vienna. Karlovitz brought an end to the Great Turkish War that lasted for 14 years. However, peace in early modern Europe seldom lasted for long. In less than two decades, the Ottomans clashed with Russia as they recaptured Azov, and with Venice as they recaptured Morea. However, their attempts to retake Hungary failed. Once again, Eugene of Savoy would be at the forefront of thwarting their attempts to seize Hungary. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. Thank you for making. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. You can also support our. I need to leave a sacrifice. Yeah, to be honest, like, I, look, I, I just don't get a great video as always. Sacrifice. Um. I don't want to say it was. 
it wasn't the most like genius level of military planning that I saw. So I it just the fact that this is the like the battle that Napoleon studied. It was cool, so interesting. I'm just I'm just wondering exactly what was so revolutionary or so. I mean, clearly they destroyed the opponent. So maybe in that aspect, it was just. Too big of an up, uh, not an upset, too big of a whopping by the opponent for Napoleon to ignore that kind of battle to study. But it, I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say, uh, can teach me something, and I hope you learned something yourself. And uh, I'll see you guys next time, all right? Bye, guys.